and this will be a presentation about the first um, set of the tools, which Barbara mentioned in her presentation about engaging stakeholders in co-design of sustainability pathways. Um, so there's been multiple people who've been working on this, and uh, we had the privilege with Barbara to lead this, uh, but uh, there's been several researchers from all the ASA programs, but also that very, very importantly, we had a partnership, very strong partnerships with many different organizations in the Indus and Zambezi basics, for which we are um, very grateful and it was fantastic um, to, to work with everyone. So we've heard about these challenges, about the complexity, about uncertainty, which results often from this complexity, and also about the, the thing that now, especially in the time of fake news, different people interpret the same reality very differently. And uh, although we kind of understand it, um, uh, we seem to understand it, everyone cannot. Yes, yes, this is the systems, uh, in interconnections and so on. In practice, unfortunately, it's so much, so many times it looks like in this slide that we don't grasp quite, especially when it comes to our interests, we don't grasp the interdependencies. In the, in, the, in the big system. So how can we work with this complexity? I mean, the, the, this is the one way, you know, and of course um, uh, we are trying to build as detailed model as possible to better and better represent uh, the real world issues. Uh, however, uh, there, there, there is a problem uh, with this approach uh, sometimes. And the problem can be summarized with this cartoon that it's not so easy to, uh, actually pass this knowledge from these big models to, to society. So in these projects, we were trying to do both, uh, both to develop best state-of-the-art uh, models uh, to represent the nexus problems, but also to work on how we can engage um, society, how we can engage uh, policymakers and co-design this with them. So yeah, we've seen also this, uh, can scientists and policymakers work together? Many people notice uh, that there is a gap and this gap is coming, uh, some people even question this, this is um, some article which has been published, which is a um, provocative way to uh, show the, the differences that scientists looking of course to advance science, whereas policymakers has a different goal to obtain popular support and win the next elections. We as scientists want to put out papers, while well, policymakers have all kinds of fires to put out and it's not so easy. So we, as scientists, we're searching for truth uh, and policymakers search for compromise. We use very different language. Uh, of course, scientific language is very complicated, not easily understood, but it's also not so easy always to follow the policymakers with all the acronyms and, and, and trends. And finally, on the time scale, we always want uh, more research is needed, we want more time, whereas um, from the policy perspective, answers are needed instantly, like to say, for yesterday. So with these differences, which are of course here magnified, it's not always uh, this way, but that's often, often this kind of problems appear to be. How can we make these two sides uh, work together, including also broader society. So one potential hint to improving this science policy interface comes from a very interesting article, Decision Making, It's Not What You Think, by Minsberg and Wesley. So they suggesting that when it comes to decisions, uh, it's not only the thinking mode is often overemphasized. It's too much energy which is put into pure thinking, planning, verbal, facts, well, of course, science. Uh, what we need to add to this, it's not to replace it, but add to this is also the mode which is more artistic, visioning, seeing first. Uh, the grand, uh, well, we have now this uh, great Netflix show and uh, chess grandmasters, they, they don't only analyze, they, at one point they see the whole images, they have the insights about where, which way to go. And finally, there's also another uh, faculty which uh, you can call doing first all the people who are learned by doing, trying different things, and, and they, it's very visceral. Uh, it starts from experience, not from planning. So all these modes are quite important in, um, in making effective um, decisions. So um, there's another source. Uh, there's another source, uh, research source, which has been um, uh, multiple articles, uh, and we probably may have heard about it. It's called the Cold Cycle. 
So it's uh, Kolb, David Kolb emphasized that uh, any learning, and we're talking about learning very generally here, it's not only the learning in school, we all learn when we do the modeling, when we do policy making. So, so this learning should always balance between concrete and the abstract. And at the same time, you should balance between doing the experimentation, but also reflection, thinking, observation. So this dimension has to be covered in, in any program which intends to link science and policymakers. So how can we bridge um, this gap? Uh, well, we, we have some experiences which we would like to share how we, how we attempted to do this. So the approach that we propose um, is active, both active and experiential. It's reflexive and conceptual at the same time. It's both problem-oriented. We use the best tools of the systems analysis, but at the same time, it's people-oriented. So we emphasize communication and collaboration between different people. So it can be summarized by the uh, Chinese philosopher Xian Ze, who said, tell me, and I forget. Show me, and I may remember. Engage me, and I will understand. So, uh, one such an approach, which we have uh, tried in this, um, uh, tried in the project, is starting from serious games, is using serious games. So, with games, uh, we are more in a kind of procedural mode. We're not just hearing, like we're doing right now, unfortunately, uh, but we are doing things, we're trying, and this kind of artificial world uh, provides opportunity for learning. So one game which has been applied in this project was the Nexus game, uh, which explored these different synergies. And you may think that games are mostly for fun, but we're talking about serious games here. And you can see in the faces that people actually are, can be quite serious, discussing even in this uh, artificial world, but we represents very well the features of the, uh, of the, of, of the reality that people are very engaged and they can explore key interactions between water, food and energy uh, nexus. Uh, so we did it in both basins, both in, in, in Zambezi and in Intus Basin. Uh, we applied this gaming approach and uh, we hope that the game will continue to be used in this way. Uh, the, the other aspect about this um, approach, one is, which I just mentioned, is about interactivity, engagement, uh, direct um, possibility to, to do, to try and uh, things and, and see the consequences. The other aspect is that any approach has to be, of course, future-oriented. And there's this method which most of you are probably aware, uh, which is about, um, which is the method of the scenario planning. But it's been, as we know, difficult um, to make predictions. Uh, well, especially about the future, uh, which has been set by the Niels Bohr. Um, so many people resort to forecasts, but forecasts often fail in complex realities of this type, like interactions between water, food, energy, environment. So uh, the scenario methodology has been used uh, here to, to fill the gap, and we're we looking not just in, we're not trying to predict one future, we're trying to look into many uh, potential futures, and we're trying to learn from this. So scenario has been defined, there are many definitions, but one of them is this is consistent and coherent descriptions of alternative hypothetical futures. We're looking broadly into many different directions that reflect different perspectives. That's very important because different people have different values that they bring to this uh, process. On past, present, and future developments, which can serve as a basis for action. And I would like here to emphasize this uh, basis for action as a very important component of this, what we were trying also to achieve in this project. So we know many uh, existing scenario efforts, such as uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which produced these very nice scenarios, uh, which has been extremely useful. But with many global scenarios, there's been several problems which has been identified to make them more actionable. One of them is that this global efforts has uh, taken the control from the participants often. They produced these global scenarios and they didn't allow people, participants to actually say, well, no matter what happens globally, what we can do. So it can be called, and it's been called in the literature, the sphere of control and identifying the specific decision units. So it's tremendously important to leave the sphere of control for the stakeholders who can affect it directly but they can also affect what is called 
the sphere of influence, which is, in other words, transactional environments. There are other stakeholders, businesses, governments, investors, citizens, regulators and NGOs. And well, it's not so easy, of course, to, to, to affect them, but it's um, always, um, always possible uh, to try. And finally, as a broadest level, we have what we call the sphere of uncertainty with all the kind of geopolitical trends, changes in global economies and prices, climate change, demographics, technology development and different social values. So that's the contextual environment when we apply scenario and then trying to respond within this sphere of influence and control. What, need to, what is also very important uh, that why, when we give this ability for any group of stakeholders who are engaged in the specific process, in the specific place, that the output of this process is not only direct input to the decision making, it's also what is called social learning. And the social learning is now one of the biggest uh, expected and actual outputs in the um, engaging, stakeholder engagement process for sustainability. So it's important that the social learning is happening, it provides, um, leads to the change in understanding and very importantly, that goes beyond the individual to become situated within wider social units or communities of practice for social interactions between actors within social networks. So we have this broader impacts of the process and it's quite often not necessarily that the process like this will directly change any specific decision, but it will lead to broader understanding which will affect many future decisions to come. Um, so with this in mind, uh, if we combine now the best aspects of the serious games and of scenarios, we came up with an approach which we uh, called policy simulations. And in this approach, we start from the specific problems, uh, engaging different stakeholders, looking what is there. It's not always great what we see, but we have to see this. And of course, different stakeholders bring different perspectives may not understand each other initially, maybe many things to overcome, but as we keep the communication going, as we communicate also in a more tangible and visual way, uh, they may start to grasp the complexity, the interrelationships between different systems elements. So with this understandings come the creative part where we can come up with the solutions which now result from mutual understanding and better understanding of the system and hopefully this part leads to agreement. It may be a consensus, win-win in the ideal world, it may sometimes be only a compromise, but this is good enough uh, to commit everyone to specific actions in the real world. And of course, this is the process which I show is simplified. This is never so simple and easy, but this is kind of ideal that we strive for and then we try it here in the region. So we've... Um, taking the lessons into account that I mentioned earlier about the need for the sphere of influence. We have in Eastward project, we have clearly distinguished this internal sphere and we called um, within the sphere with stakeholders, we co-develop what we call regional pathways. The plans, visions, policy strategies, and we put them in the context of the scenarios, which are linked, uh, of course, with the different uh, with IPCC, but also uh, potentially linked with other existing frameworks, especially SDGs. And we made this, of course, very active. Um, as I so everyone was uh, invited to look at these different challenges and solutions, and how can we get from where we are now to 2050 um, in a in a sustainable way? That we at the end we have uh, we achieve sustainability, and we look, of course, into this nexus aspect. So, in a more detail, we uh, we start from this. Um, halfway focus with, with the stakeholders. We start from the current situation. And of course, this is all embedded in this uh, external context uh, with the scenarios, as has been explained before. And from the current situation, we first go to business as usual. And as you can see, this initial pathway, this is maybe not something super exciting. We go, we continue the trends, we see many challenges. There are, of course, some existing policies, but well, business as usual is for reference. Then we start to look at the, as you can see on the right, desired futures. What the future we want to be. 
And as we start on the path, we, of course, there are multiple challenges and quite soon we may come up to the big trade-offs. So for example, in water, we can ask, do we want to continue with the big, a large scale water infrastructure or should we put the priority on the nature-based solution? So from this trade-offs, different pathways to the future may emerge depending how we answer this. And there are a specific set of technologies, infrastructures and policies which will be used along any pathway to the desired future. This desired future is serving as a reference for business as usual. But if we from trade-off can take the different route, we may actually end up in different place. And there might be multiple trade-offs as we go along, but eventually we may reach different um, version of the future that we want. And the several different futures may, it's very important to reflect different values which are brought into the table. It shouldn't be, um, it should be avoided to bring all the stakeholders to force them prematurely to focus only on one. We might still have a look at the overlap between these different desired futures and trying to find what is actionable and how can it go. So, so this is a visual depiction of how this um, policy simulation process uh, looks like. And we also have seen earlier the slide how it's actually happened step by step and with researchers and stakeholders working side by side. So starting from the current situation that we know, we also develop the scenarios, which is usually done by uh, researchers, uh, but sometimes we may ask some stakeholders to contribute. And this current situation is a basis for uh, uh, de desired, de developing desired futures, uh, which we see develop in these different pathways. So uh, what is important here that we uh, allow stakeholders to develop their visions, how they see the future. And in parallel, scientists are working with using research model and analysis. And we took what stakeholders were bringing as an input to develop these models. But that's not where we end up. Um, we, we, we continue to work together. So the researchers also providing feedback and revision suggestions for stakeholders who then in turn provide feedback and corrections to, to researchers. So these two streams that you see in parallel here, stakeholder visions and research model and analysis, they are working in parallel. Uh, so many projects bring stakeholders only as a kind of experts who bring input and develop to develop the models, but then it's left here, these two uh, parallel streams are autonomous. And of course we have a convergence, but um, in the same way as researchers can bring uh, additional elements and clarity to stakeholder visions, in the same way, stakeholders can bring additional ideas which may not be so easy to capture uh, by scientists. So, for example, in many countries, the agriculture is a big, uh, huge water user, and it might be with the modeling uh, optimization, we can find interesting alternative uh, water allocation um, um, schemes. However, politically, it may be very difficult in a given country. So. So the, the stakeholder visions can take into account these different institutional and political realities, which may be still quite difficult to capture in the research models. So now I would like to ask you finally to the short trip to these two different basins to show how it worked in, in practice, uh, the Zambezi and Indus. And I'm going to start from the uh, short uh, video and apologize, maybe the quality coming through the web through the Zoom may not be great. But this uh, will soon be also available as a longer movie that you will be able to see. So um, uh, hopefully you can see uh, some of this, although it will be a little bit uh, cut. So I hope you were able to see at least some of the pictures. Uh, the, the video is more smooth and we will share this, of course, uh, later. So let's start from the application of the policy simulation in the Zambezi Basin. Uh, this is a, a, the presentation where I show the approach momentologically. Uh, you will see the specific results, how it was taken by the modeling uh, teams in the next presentation. But here I want to emphasize and show you in practice all these assumptions which I show earlier, how they look, how they look in, in um, 
when we when we did the workshop. So as you can see on the screen, you have uh, multiple um, elements, the visual elements, they're very tangible. Uh, participants can choose from all kinds of both system elements, but also processes and indicators, which they can put specifically on the map to indicate where are the important processes happening. And they, we use this approach both for talking about current situations, but we also use this visual approach to develop the visions of the future. So they can indicate how, in very concrete terms, not general, not abstract, how the future may look like in their basic. Um, so uh, as participants indicated for us the key benefits of this approach, uh, we get the fantastic feedback from, uh, from the Zambezi uh, River uh, Commission um, that the, there was very high and usual, uh, even as was said, participation with this method. Um, it gave participants more information than other method which they had experienced and very impressive information sharing. So it wasn't only going one way, it was happening in actually different languages at the same time and exchange in different uh, small and, and breakout groups. Um, finally, uh, the participants were able with all this chaos around people talking, moving, changing this visual information, they were able to develop a shared sense of direction, which was a, a great achievement as was felt by participants. So in the words of the participants, their workshop was an eye opener to linking practical knowledge to available science, which I feel as a great achievement because we wanted to contribute. We see this not only as science, which is brought to stakeholders, but we see this also as scientists who learn from this practical knowledge and experience. This is there in the basic. Okay, also a, a short glimpse on the industry of basic and how we apply the policy simulation there. So the process was looking quite similar. Of course, the dynamics is always different depending on the on the on the basin, on the country, and the people who join. And we, in the same way, we use this visual information to develop both current situation, business as usual, and desired future visions, and also then to look into the pathways from now into the future. So in, in Indus Basin, we also managed to make a next steps and linking with the in the second workshops when we linked with the outputs of the of the models, we were able to prepare something which looks like a game, but it's not a game. It's actual uh, physical representation of the modeling outputs where each uh, token that you can see uh, on the picture has been representing specific uh, values, uh, cubic kilometers of water, energy production, agricultural productions. And it was great exercise to actually, uh, not only to see the potential consequences of different um, scenarios, but also to get information for us on the specific uh, arrangements and um, how things are working in the, in the base. Uh, so the last part of this uh, simulation, I would like to show you um, what also Barbara announced that, uh, well, with the COVID, we have to, at the end of the project, we had to switch and change um, to, um, to working online. And we didn't manage to, unfortunately, uh, we still hope for this, to engage our partners in the basins. We used an opportunity of another project and uh, translated this methodology into an online work. So I'm going to show this. Uh, test case, uh, how, we, how we did it, and there will be soon a publication, the guidebook coming that you all can look and see how it's working and applied. So we used the, uh, the maybe multiple tools could be used. We have selected the tools called Miro, which some of you may have heard. There are other tools like this, for example, Mural, or maybe some which I haven't heard, which could be used for this. This is basically a kind of whiteboard that you can put different information in a visual form, of course, posted, but also other uh, visual elements. So in the same way as we use maps that you've seen in previous pictures, we can use this uh, whiteboard to collect the information from different stakeholders. And they all work uh, from homes, uh, probably. They can also gather in one place and one person can share this, um, what they do, uh, take input and put it into the computer. But they all working at the same time on the same, on the same representation of the system. So we can prepare the, this uh, information in advance. Um, this is the application that we did in the Andalusia region in, in Spain. And there is an area that um, is used for participants, but you can also provide all kinds of additional information like the model outputs or existing uh, information maps uh, for them. So I'm magnifying here, this is the canvas, this is the map, and uh, here are the different provinces in Andalusia. So they can put information either directly on the map in the specific place or they can 
assign it to one of the provinces or maybe the whole Andalusia if the process applies to the whole region. And this is how it looks like from kind of distance uh, after the workshop. All these elements that you can see are the elements brought by stakeholders, participants, in the same way as the cards that you have seen earlier in the Indus and Zambezi applications. So if I magnify and come a little bit closer, you can start to see elements. They can add all kinds of comments, which you can see on the post-its. Um, magnifying even more, you can see the, the level of detail. Um, so again, we have specific elements, we have processes, and you can also notice there are um, uh, linking the causal connections between specific participant, uh, specific system elements, like wildfires may lead to property damage and ecosystems. We have prepared in the same way, as you can see this trace earlier with cards, we have prepared uh, this kind of virtual trace uh, with different, uh, so on the left of this of the slide, you can see water, food, energy, economy. These are the system elements available for the water topics. So stakeholders are free to use any of these pre-existing elements, but they can always add the new element which we haven't prepared before. What is very nice uh, here in the online application that you can do quite uh, even more easily than in the face-to-face uh, -face workshops, you can do interesting analysis. So for example, one type of uh, analysis of the outputs that I'm showing you now is that we look at the specific hazards which has been identified in different provinces. And this is the hazards, distribution of these hazards in different provinces in the way as has been provided, information has been provided by participants. Uh, you can also, I mean, with this, um, causal connections which has been identified, you can also build a bigger causal map. Um, and this is one of the scenarios which has been identified starting from high temperature and low precipitation and how it continues in different areas, water, environment, uh, food, energy, and general uh, impact on, on society. Um, so that's something which can be also then taken as a direct input um, to the modeling, um, which, is, which is done later. So, um, I gave you a brief tour uh, of how our stakeholder engagement was working. I gave you some also information um, why we have chosen this way. And our purpose is to develop this uh, sustainability pathways, starting from the current situations, looking at the desired or you may say also resilient futures um, for from the stakeholder perspective. And of course, we want to link it and have a very strong interaction between stakeholders and scientists. So this is mutual learning and the final output is, is reflecting this mutual um, engagement. Um, so uh, with this, uh, we're coming slowly to the end of this presentation and um, globally, uh, we know that this is a, a more and more difficult situations. The global challenges become bigger and bigger. With climate change, we have less and less time to act. Um, so I think we, everyone, almost everyone globally now realize that it's time that we've got to talk, um, as you can see on this cartoon. However, it matters a lot how do we talk. Do we continue to only do presentations, big plenary sessions, or do we, do we try to use more interactive, engaging modes of um, working together, which use the knowledge, skills, experience, and talents of everyone who is involved. And uh, we've be, been fantastic journey here, which was possible with um, all researchers and our partners, with all stakeholders. And we hope um, that it may inspire um, some other uh, places to, to go. And of course, we are very happy to learn and we continue to learn on on our side. So uh, we, have, we are preparing now the, the guidebook for how to run this um, policy simulations and looking at the COVID situations. We are focusing on how to do this online. There also will be a longer video which will be represent, um, describe this uh, general process and the guidebook providing step by step. So please look at the ISWAL website. It will come in a few weeks, uh, should be before the end of the year. So thank you again. I would like to uh, thank you very, very much our all the stakeholders, all the organizations and individuals who have been involved. It wouldn't be possible without this. Uh, we learned tremendously and this has been our joint journey. And um, I think it's time now to um, for some questions. 
Thank you, Piot. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, one person, uh, Universal Simplexity, uh, he's asking how is Bukenes, which applies for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, is taken into considerations on the on the pathways. Uh, how are these dimensions being uh, accounted for in the pathways? Thank you. Uh, thanks. That's, that's a fantastic question. So uh, I was trying to emphasize it and I, um, in the way we planned methodologically. So one way which I mentioned is that we're not looking into one single future, but we're trying to use, um, so that's uh, the ambiguity aspects, different values that stakeholders will bring, that they look at the maybe different uh, desired futures. And of course, at one point, it has to be translated into into action. Um, but um, uh, so some common ground is necessary, but we we are leaving this more open. And I see the continuation from you. What are actually pathways? So the pathways is the is the strategies, plans which uh, explain, or also narrative storylines, uh, maybe supported by the modeling effort, which is starting from the current situation provide an account how do we reach the desired future what has to be done and when what policies has to be implemented what technologies has to be used what infrastructures has to be added with a human uh, man-made uh, built infrastructure or nature-based um, uh, solutions this is all that should be like in, in a pathway but we are emphasizing here that we're working on the multiple pathways which can represent these different values Another aspect of this uh, VUCA uncertainty is that we also mentioned this um, earlier that we have these um, uh, scenarios that we uh, take into account. So the scenarios which provide this uh, sphere of uncertainties are used in the process to, um, to challenge the pathways which has been developed. If we have some kind of global fragmentation as a scenario, is the pathway which has been developed for the region, is it still robust to these scenarios? How do we deal with this? What special actions do we need to take uh, if the global developments go maybe not the way we would like it to be? So this robustness analysis is part also of the approach um, that we want to look at different scenarios and adjust the pathways um, on the way. Great. We are getting a few more questions. So Ursula is asking what game that is. I guess that applies for the Nexus game. So maybe you want to uh, uh, say where, where to make this game available. Yes, so the, uh, the, the thanks for the question. This is uh, exactly the, the Nexus game which we have developed. Uh, uh, we will provide the information in our presentations, the links uh, where you can uh, go there. Um, for the moment, unfortunately, the Nexus game is only available as a game for face-to-face -face workshops. We don't have the online uh, version of this game yet. We're looking for the opportunities to develop this so it may be much easier to, to use. But we, we will share the information in the materials about the Nexus game so you can Yes, uh, yeah, we're getting quite a few more questions. Uh, Bhopal is asking what level of data and information got your experience while working in remote areas of these basins and how did you solve these challenges? Mm. Well, that's a difficult question, I have to admit. So, um, I, I mean, I try to present the, the, all the, the best features of our approach, but there's always uh, a room for improvement. And um, I think that we were trying to do our best in this first approach. We were coming from far here from Europe and we were relying on our partners to bring the broad representation of, of stakeholders into the room. And I wish that we could organize these workshops, not just in, well, we had one of them in Vienna, we have one in Harare, we have one, we have separate workshops in India and in Pakistan and New Delhi and Lahore, but uh, then we had one workshop in Kathmandu, but I think this is, this is a good question. I wish we could um, continue and maybe go and organize such a regional workshops in different provinces so that we can increase the participation of the people who are quite often excluded. So that's definitely, uh, I see here for us, a further room for development, and I hope there will be uh, this um, the opportunity to, to do this. Thank you for the question. I think this is very important. I didn't mention this, how important it is to to make sure that um, so many different uh, voices and values and people who are often, as I said, excluded are uh, included in such a process. We are getting a lot more questions, so probably we you might not be able to answer them, all of them, um, online. Uh, but um, 
I think as we move on, we can, uh, Piot and I can answer those on the on the Q and A. Um, maybe we can take one last question. Uh, Hassan uh, is asking. My understanding from the scenarios was that they are built from drivers in different pathways, but you are discussing about desired futures, and it seems you start from the future. Would you please um, explain more? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, there's been a, a few slides earlier, which when I mentioned this difference between what we call decision units, uh, the, what we call sphere of influence, uh, sphere of control, sphere of influence, and sphere of uncertainty. So there are different approaches to developing scenarios. And yes, we deliberately take the different approach. Actually, if you look at the history of scenario development, one of the first scenarios has been developed in the Shell oil company in the 60s, when they looked into the potential futures uh, what might happen, and they didn't know what will happen, but they've seen one of the scenarios when the group of countries will uh, actually uh, create a so it's in, in de facto cartel, you know, and, and the, the prices may change, their situation may change. And because they predicted this as one potential future, they took some actions which would prepare them to this future. And then they were ahead of other oil com Western oil companies. So, well, I don't want to advertise any oil companies here, but what Shell did methodologically was um, quite revolutionary at the time. And uh, I think the, the initially there was a very clear difference between this sphere of uncertainty, what is outside in the world, what they can't control, and the, the sphere of uh, control and influence, which they could affect and prepare for. And this approach, we, we give the sphere of control. Uh, it's been also our experience working with multiple stakeholders uh, that um, they want actually to, to see the possibility to affect the situation. They not only want to see what may happen globally and all this, especially this bad scenario like fragmentation and so on, but they want to see how can we still thrive even if the scenario is not going if the global development is not going as we would like it to be. So, so that's the rationale for this. And this has been several research papers which emphasize this, that this global scenario efforts, which only provides the global storylines, are missing still this very essential element when engaging with stakeholders. So, so that's the rationale. And I'm the, I also add to the presentation links to the research articles, which can explain it further.